I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Ainian Samirisan. He will speak on Esophagus, the landmark publications. Respected uh, chairpersons, senior professors, and my dear friends. Uh, at the outset, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk on uh, landmark publications in relation to the esophagus. So uh, my brief was to talk on uh, three papers. Uh, the first one that I've selected is the one uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And this is the cross trial which uh, you're all aware of. So I'll try to be brief on this paper. So this was on preoperative chemo, chemo radiotherapy for um, esophageal or junctional cancer. And this is from the cross group in Netherlands. And they looked at safety, tolerance, and efficacy of neoadjuvant chemoradiation in relation to carcinoma of the esophagus. Um, this was a randomized control trial. They uh, randomized patients into two groups. The first group was randomized to chemoradiotherapy and surgery. The second one was only surgery. And um, there were 178 in one group and uh, 188 in the other one. And uh, they selected patients with uh, no major comorbidities um, who had good performance status, obviously. But the chemotherapy used was uh, partly Taxel and Carboplatin. They gave five cycles, along with 41.4 uh, grays of radiation. And surgery was performed four to six weeks later. And this was an intention to treat analysis. And uh, the primary endpoint was overall survival. And looking at the uh, complications in relation to chemoradiotherapy, 91% um, were able to complete the full course. There were major complications in only about 7%, and the 30-day mortality in both the groups were 4%. And in relation to cancer uh, results, R0 resection was able to be completed in 92%. The pathological complete response rate was uh, about 30%. And if you look at squamous cell carcinomas alone, it was nearly 50%. Uh, the node harvest rate was 15 versus 18. And the median overall survival was uh, 50 months. And that's the graph showing the survival. The chemo, RT, and surgery group, group did significantly better. And if you look at uh, the survival according to the tumor type, uh, the squamous cell carcinoma patients who had chemo RT and surgery did the best. And uh, this is the uh, hazard ratio for death. Again, the chemo RT and surgery uh, patients did better in all these subgroup analysis. Uh, there's a few uh, things in this study uh, which uh, they could have done better is the distribution of the surgical procedures uh, has not been mentioned in the two groups. Uh, these patients were not restaged after neoadjuvant therapy. So it was not routinely uh, done. And uh, follow up investigations was performed only if there was a clinical suspicion of recurrence. So apart from these small uh, minor things, it was a well conducted study and certainly shows that uh, neoadjuvant chemo radiotherapy is uh, safe and has uh, survival benefit. Now, the next paper that I've selected is uh, from the diseases of esophagus from this year, uh, June 2013. And this is about radical lymphadenectomy in esophageal cancer. The reason I selected this is that it seemed to give a balanced view of the whole uh, subject. So, in this uh, review article, they talk about different things. One is the uh, transhiatal, the issue of transhiatal versus transthoracic, three field versus lesser lymphadenectomy, uh, the role of cervical lymphadenectomy, uh, and the role of um, these radical lymphadenectomies in the era of neoadjuvant therapy. Now, coming to the first one, which is transhiatal versus transthoracic. Primarily, uh, as we've discussed earlier today, it's a debate about the radicality of the lymphadenectomy. 
uh, and recent meta-analysis comparing about 52 studies uh, with more than 3,000 3, plus patients with, with transthoracic and about 2,500 transhyatal esophagectomies. Certainly the transthoracic esophagectomy patients are significantly more nodes removed. However, there was no survival difference in the two groups. Now, meta-analysis like this should, however, be interpreted with caution because the studies which were used were highly variable in their quality, and patients who underwent transthoracic obviously had more advanced tumors, so they were not really comparable groups. Uh, secondly, the issue of three-field versus two-field lymphonectomy. There are multiple non-randomized comparative studies, and if you look, if you look at the uh, five-year survival in these uh, they seem to be pretty good, I mean, 50 months. And as practiced in Japan, the mortality rates have been uh, about 4%. But you have to understand that these are experienced uh, centers doing specialized work. This, this may not be translatable to across everybody. And the survival benefits of three field has never been proven by a randomized control trial. There are two small randomized control trials, however, and they do not show survival benefit. Uh, and I have to mention that currently there is a randomized control trial uh, underway at the uh, TMH Bombay comparing three-field and two-field lymphonectomies. Uh, and I think um, Pramesh had mentioned that the results should be out in about a year or two. Uh, coming to the issue of uh, occult cervical node involvement in esophageal cancer, if you have an upper third tumor, the chance of an occult cervical node metastasis is about 40%. Uh, when you have a middle third tumor, however, it is about uh, 30%. And if you have a lower third tumor, there's still a 20% chance you're going to have an occult cervical node metastasis. Um, and this is across both squamous and adenocarcinomas. Uh, but despite cervical nodes being involved in lower third tumors, isolated cervical recurrences after a two-field lymph lymphadenectomy is rare. Uh, and in his recent publication, Uragawa calculated the impact of removal of lymph nodes in each station. And he concluded that cervical lymphadenectomy was of limited value in lower third esophageal carcinomas, both squamous and adenocarcinomas. Uh, and the role of neoadjuvant therapy uh, how does it influence the lymphadenectomy? If you look at the study, uh, if you look at Japan where three-field lymphadenectomy is routinely practiced, uh, this is done in the setting of primarily chemotherapy alone. Uh, and in the West, however, it is done uh, with neoadjuvant chemo RT. There is no published data allowing modulation of surgery following neoadjuvant chemo radiation. So in this setting, is a radical two-field lymphonectomy enough? Is it a balance between the risk and the benefit? Is a question that's still unanswered. And it really boils down to this. Does more nodes removed lead to more cures? Now this is data from, the, uh, from Tom DeMister's group. And if you look at the authors of this, the other authors, they all lead high quality esophageal units across the world. Now, they, this is about 2,000 plus patients, both adeno and squamous. And in the graph, the uh, x-axis is the number of nodes removed, and y-axis is the five-year survival. Now, across the, uh, all stages, the five-year survival was better the more number of nodes were removed. And this is the WEC data, which uh, Professor Sano was uh, alluding to earlier. Now, this is the World Esophageal Cancer Collaboration data. So nearly 5,000 patients, squamous and adenocarcinomas, again showed improved survival with more extensive lymphadenectomies. So these are all high quality data. And um, when you look at this, um, it, it, you know, superficially, or when you, when you first look at it, it's more nodes and more cures. But maybe when you look at it a little bit deeper, um, maybe there's a question mark at the end. Uh, or for some, it could even be like this, more nodes but no more cures. The reason being that, uh, again, which uh, has been mentioned in the previous uh, uh, talk, 
the problem of stage migration. Is it just that these patients are staged properly because more number of nodes are moved? It may not be a direct uh, effect of the surgery, but just the effect of proper staging that they show survival benefit. Uh, the second is obviously the selection bias that is there in almost all these trials, even the, the, the high quality studies that I've mentioned, just because not all patients are suitable for this kind of operation. And lastly is the uh, problem of standardization, both of the, the type of the esophagectomy and the extent of lymphonectomy. So this paper concludes by saying non-radical conservative lymphonectomy, probably only for very early disease, for high-risk patients and who have poor prognostic factors. So some, some form of radical lymphonectomy needs to be performed. Now, if you have lower third tumors, perhaps you could do a radical two field. But for middle third and upper third tumor, there is a role for a radical three field. And if at all you're going to do a radical three field, you have to rightly select your patients uh, there who have limited extents of disease, and um, you need to have appropriate training in this. So a tailored approach, not all patients will benefit, and uh, the debate is not yet over. And the last one that I'm going to very briefly mention is the uh, uh, publication which was in September, that's about uh, two months back, regarding poems. We saw a beautiful video yesterday. Um, so this is an international um, snapshot, if you want, of the global poem experience. Um, so this was a survey conducted by um, this group in 16 high volume centers where they pr performed this procedure. Um, and they selected uh, centers which did more than 30 per year. There were 25 people who were surveyed, uh, and more than 50 uh, percent of these people who performed this were surgeons, and amongst them they did about 850 procedures. Now, if you look at the back background, the gastroenterologists who performed this uh, had uh, performed either EMR or ESD as the background, and the surgeons who were performing this ha were performing advanced laparoscopy or notes as their background uh, prior to doing this. Uh, the success rate is quite high. This is the early success rate, I should mention, about 90 to 100 percent. You can see the graph on the left of the screen, which shows the, that the Eckhart score is quite uh, significantly low post-procedure across all the centers. And the change in the lower esophageal sphincter pressure, that's if you do a manometry, again, there is a significant decrease in the pressure uh, in, in every center that was done. Uh, but the question really is that is whether it's a durable procedure. Is, does it translate to long term? We do not have results. The only published results is about for one year. And uh, you can see that there is a decreasing trend in the durability. So it's perhaps not as, uh, not as effective, but we'll have to see uh, compared to a laparoscopic Heller's myotomy. Uh, and we've seen in the video yesterday, the muscle which is divided is a circular sphincter, which is responsible for the achalasia, and the clasp fibers are divided. The sling fibers, however, are left, and this is the argument to say that uh, an anti-reflex procedure may not be necessary. Um, but again, if you look at the uh, reflux after this procedure, uh, 20 to 40 percent have uh, reflux. So in conclusion, this says that POEM perhaps represents a notes approach to the laparoscopic Heller's myotomy. On one year follow-up, slightly more recurrences and slightly increased rates of GERD compared to laparoscopic Heller's myotomy. Um, and again, in this global experience, there was, uh, it concluded saying that standardization in, in, in relation to the length, the position of the myotomy, et cetera, needs to be done. Proper credentialing, of course, necessary. Longer term follow-up, which we don't have, is necessary, and uh, we perhaps need more uh, trials to compare with the gold standard, which is the laparoscopic Heller's myotomy. Thank you.